once you come down Hallsboro Road and make that right on Cherrytown, Cherrytown is probably about two, three miles, that whole community. Well, when you make the right to go into Cherrytown, there was a cross. Somebody had burned a cross, and I was just a kid. And I mean, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that was, but my dad knew what it was. And his neighbor, Roger Beard, knew what that was. And all of a sudden, I started seeing Dad and Rogers pulling out their guns. Making it very known that you will not do this in our community and not pay the price for it. That burning cross was found right here underneath the Cherrytown Road sign in the late 1960s. This is the entrance to a self-sustaining all-Black community in rural southeastern North Carolina. At one time, this community thrived in the midst of a booming agricultural and lumber economy monopolized by Georgia Pacific. However, as members of the town began to move up and out, some to the north during the Great Migration, and others to more industrialized parts of North Carolina, Cherrytown's population began to dwindle. So did its education levels and its median income. Now, Cherrytown is inhabited by a small handful of elderly women who have lived here all of their lives. It's the sort of place that goes unnoticed in the grand scheme of history. And it's the sort of place that could be bulldozed over in the name of progress. But as insignificant as it may seem, it holds a story that is common to many African-Americans in the South. A story of resilience, innovation, familial support, and an impeccable sense of community in the face of Jim Crow, segregation, poverty, and now the disparate impact of COVID-19. You are about to witness the legacy of my great-great-grandfather, Charlie Cherry Sr., the founder of Cherrytown, and its influence on the pursuit of equity, education, and a robust spiritual community. Walk through this door a minute, a minute Sundays. <laughs> when I go back now, all I see is a remnant of what it used to be. I see uh, names on uh, stained glass windows or on the um, pews of people that I knew, people who sewed into my life. For as long as they've been alive, church has been the place where members of Cherrytown mourn the loss of loved ones and support each other through hard times. During the pandemic, they were forced to grieve in isolation and bear their burdens alone. On top of a loneliness that appeared to have no end, they faced the challenge of obtaining accurate information about how to protect themselves from the coronavirus. For Dr. Swanee Wright, the inability to receive accurate information about when and where to get the vaccine was reminiscent of a segregated America. I'm going to get out and I'm going to find out. <laughs> and so I went there and I, want, and I wanted to know, I said, well, what's going on? You know, is this private information or what? And uh, I told her that... Um, I'm here in the house, and I, you know, I would like to be available to to school, you know, if, you know, being a retired teacher, and uh, but I can't do anything. I say I can't even get the vaccine. And I'm gonna tell you what I said. I said, I said well, uh, is this a black and white thing? Given the town's past within the broader context of a racialized America, community members can't help but notice potential parallels. Even those who no longer live in the community are concerned about its future. And so unfortunately, unless we have something that will bring the people back, it's going to uh, be one of those towns where it's, it's not what it used to be. Still, the fear of a bleak future does not dampen the powerful memories of those who call Cherrytown home 
no matter where they've migrated. When I think of Cherrytown, I think of home. My grandmother was a major part of my life. She would always say when she was going to Cherrytown that she was going home. So when I say I'm going to Cherrytown, I say I'm going home even though I never lived there. Cherrytown is my life. This is my roots. Cherrytown is where my family grew up. My mom, my grandmother, I spent much of my life there. I remember at Christmas time um, when kids got their bikes, you could see kids riding up and down the road um, with their new bicycles. And I also remember us playing kickball in the streets. We had softball tournaments, so it was a very robust community, lots of families. I think Cherrytown had the real image of a village raising because of the grandparents, one set of grandparents lived this way and one lived that way, and we were all within walking distance. If somebody was in trouble, all of us were in trouble. When, when they're joyful, we all laugh. So many of those memories are rooted in centuries-old African-American traditions. Somebody roaring down the community hollering, hog killing, hog killing, hog killing. And all the neighborhood would come to that particular house. And there was a, a man named uh, Harry King. Harry King. Harry King was the one that would take the knife and stay up the hog, I think in the throat, you know, and while the hog has been hung up. And uh, the hog has been clean and whatnot. Then we eat hog cracklers and so forth. And the book of Acts where it say that the people had all things in common. They laid everything at the apostles' feet and the apostles distributed as needed. Everyone in the community had something to eat. The ladies would come and they would uh, all come together and help quilt so that all the families would have quilts to keep them warm. They would come by and from house to house they would make quilts for each other. It was a sharing process. It was a helping process. They grew what they needed on the farm. They had their corn and they, you know, they, harv they had their beans and they had their chickens and they had their pigs. And so it was an it a, a ecosystem of itself. The architect of that ecosystem was Charlie Cherry Sr. His vision for Cherrytown is carried in the hearts of those who knew him, and his wildest dreams are being fulfilled by those who carry his legacy. We grew up in a community that cared for everyone in it and outside us as well. Uh, your great granddaddy had a store over there. He didn't turn nobody away. If a child went in and wanted a piece of candy, Mr. Charlie would reach over and get that child a piece of candy because he knew that child didn't have no money to pay. My father died when I was two. My mother had seven other children. Aunt Mamie, we call her Aunt Mamie, and Aunt Ollie, and Mr. Charlie helped my mother to raise us. For a long time, I thought Mr. Charlie was my father until one day he and mom and all of them took me aside and talked to me. This is not your father. Your father has passed away after I got older, because two years old wouldn't understand. And, uh, but I loved him just like he was my father. He used to be going to the field, I would follow him, foot to foot. My grandfather had the foresight to see that there was a need, a country store in a country town. And he, he persisted. He, uh, he even sold gasoline at that, st that store and other needs for the community. And people would come and, you know, and patronize him. And he would even gave a few people uh, an opportunity to work in there a little bit. But that was foresight. I mean, to, to have foresight during that time when, 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 when blacks were obviously thrown behind purposely, 
And to be successful in it, there had to be a special gift. Where he got the money, I don't know. Because there were no, there were no open avenues for people to make, blacks to make a lot of money. My daddy made $40 a week and he raised 11 children. Our great grand, well, great grand for me and great great for you, he, he had a store. He had a business. Do you, you know, that made me feel so special. And at that time we were living in apartments in New York and um, our family had property. They owned the land they lived on. Cherrytown is ours. It's ours. When I see my mother with 88 years of faithfulness and to see her teaching last week. You couldn't tell us we were less. <laughs> we No, we would not accept that because our parents consistently told us that we're the head and not the tail and, and kept those expectations even though we wore hand-me-down clothes. We were somebody and we were going to be somebody. We, we, we want to think that we're just as good as anybody. <laughs> I was always amazed with my, my great-grandfather because that was the house that you actually saw a little library because he read and that was amazing to me. Grandpa Charlie had books in his house and that was rare. That was rare. And my mom, since she loved reading, she would read books. And she said when she she would send them down south, and um, they were like, Henrietta sending all those books. Um, I guess they thought Henrietta was rich, but Henrietta was rich. <laughs> She's okay in retirement. That's a different story. Perhaps no one in Cherrytown has exceeded Charlie Cherry Sr.'s expectations like his grandson, Dr. Charles Cherry. With a doctorate in education from Vanderbilt University and an illustrious career at Elizabeth City State University, Dr. Cherry has made a profound and inspiring impact in education. 20 years in public ed, 20 years in higher ed, and also in that process, I also became the uh, president of the National Alumni Association. And my colleagues were how can you do all of that? I said, well, you had to see the big picture. I wanted to make or uh, help make um, Cherrytown proud. And this is the cliche right here. I got to tell you this one. There were several people in my neighborhood, my community, who had started the school, but they didn't finish. I was the first one who finished the process. And not only did I finish unit four process, probably you saw you saw my credentials, and I kept going and I kept giving. And I just believe that, as the good book says, uh, God loves a cheerful giver, and it doesn't mean money all the time. And I feel the same way about my community. I always give back to it. I feel the same way about my university. I always give back to it because it has given so much to me. Prior to the schools uh, actually mandating integration, uh, my father um, signed us up to uh, integrate um, Hallsboro High School. We were going to the all-white school, <laughs> and um, that was very interesting, to, to say the least, um, to be the first ones to, to go to Hallsboro. And when integration, um, based on the uh, Brown versus Board of Education um, um, case, I was approached to be the first black to go to the white school to integrate the process. 
And I stayed there for two years. And uh, when it came down to promotions, I was not considered. I recognized that neither did I have my credentials, but neither did they. It was the first time that I was actually, con that I felt really confronted on a daily base basis of people not liking us being there. We had students that were told us we should go back to our schools. Um, we um, had teachers that were not very friendly to us. Um, I can give you an example that, um, that really hurts my heart to today because I was young at the time. I think I was eighth or ninth grade and um, we were in, the home, in a home economics class and we were doing some project and uh, we had gotten paint all over our hands. And the teacher there, she was wiping all the white girls' hands and getting the paint off their hands. And when, she, when I came up to her, she turned her back. My family was very large. There were eight children. And my mother was trying to go back to school to get her GED and to go on and get her college degree. And I didn't realize it. I, I realized it as when I became an adult that we were poor. I had to receive free and reduced lunch. So we met the definition for poverty. And because of that, I don't believe that many of my teachers, particularly in the lower grades, saw my potential and saw my ability and put me on that college track. I think many of us, when they saw us, maybe we used bad grammar or we didn't have the nice clothes. And let's just face it, your zip code and where you live. So I would imagine that um, some doors were probably closed to me because of my zip code. We were automatically um, put in certain um, groups academically in, the, in, in high school. I was in um, the general education, yet I attended Chapel Hill. How could you have that many daughters and that many college degrees, right? I'm like, really? <laughs> it's okay if you have one or two daughters and they both go to college, but to have that many daughters and they, you can, that is amazing that, you know, that, the intention was there. If you have an education, nobody can take that away from you. My grandmother worked when most women stayed at home and the men worked. My grandfather, of course, was hardworking. They were the first ones in the community that had a tele television. And it was a black and white and it was beautiful and everyone would come on Saturdays to watch the baseball game, you know, and, 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 and that, was, that was so exciting because people didn't have televisions. You know, many people had, they had kerosene heater, kerosene lighting because they could not afford electricity. We never saw black people on TV. And we were all there watching this Saturday show and Chubby Checker was on TV and he was twisting the night away, you know, the song, you know. And we were like, oh, a black man is on TV. And everybody, was, they were just laughing and laughing because we had never seen anything like that before. Um, it's the same with, with the, watching the fights, you know, um, watching Joe Lewis, you know, watching the, watching, the, watching the fights because we did not see black people on TV. And so it was, it was an awakening for us. So that's how close the people were. I mean, for everybody in this little community to come together and and just imagine they're peering in this box, 
and watching these people on TV. That was great. <laughs> Just as people would crowd around a single black and white television to watch Chubby Checker or Joe Lewis, they would also surround each other in support. Education was a community effort in so many ways, especially in terms of a long-standing commitment by Second St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church to ensure that students in Cherrytown could succeed. I like to go back to 1948 when I started school. We were going down here to a little school across this road, Pine Hill Road, and further over there was well, all farmland now. But there was a little schoolhouse where I went to school until I was in the sixth grade. My mother, Nona Crawford, very outspoken person, she hired Mr. Stumpy Wilson to carry her to Whiteville and went to the Board of Education. Yes, she did. And she stood up before those people that she had never seen in her life before. And she told them, she says, I'm tired of the children being half taught because there were so many children in a one-room school about as big as this house, maybe a little larger, in one room. And the other part, outside in the woods, because we were surrounded by woods. And she told me, like well, I'm tired of these children, part of them in the school and part of them in the woods. So, what they did, they negotiated with Second St. Paul, remember it? Old church used to sit over there across the road. Used to be a road go through there. So they negotiated with the church to allow part of the students to go and to the church for classes until they consolidated the schools of all the schools in Bow Township and Farmers Union into one Artesia High that opened up in 1951. But my mother, she she didn't let no man stand her down. She would stand flat-footed and tell him just what she had to tell him. Second St. Paul offered itself as a building in support of local public schools, and it kept students out of trouble with one special extracurricular activity, performing gospel music. I, I remember the, the chariot singers, and I remember... Uh, the Second St. Paul Choir that went all the way to Duke University uh, for about a whole week. They heard about us. We sang it with hand clapping, hand clapping, foot stomping, and got a pastor right singing, Satan, I'm going to turn your kingdom down. And, and, uh, and, and, and we just love each other. Our choir was so great until uh, we had three appointments on one Sunday. We'll send one this way, one to the north, east, south. It was the love of my brother. Um, my brother passed away a year ago. He always wanted to be a professional singer. You know, and so he put this group together. It was myself, my sister Ann and Lorraine, and just my brother. He was the lead singer of the Chariot Singers. And he had such great aspirations for us. So much so, even though he worked in the uh, a yarn factory, he saved up all of his money for us to go into a recording studio. And can you imagine that being in high school? We're going to cut a record, <laughs> you know? And so there we were in the studio with the headphones on and we're singing, we're gonna make a record. And indeed we made a 45 and he was so proud and he would book these programs with these professional gospel singers and we would be the opening act. My brother worked hard and he earned um, and he bought us these uniforms and we had them made. Oh, we had professional pictures made, you know, just kind of <laughs> doing all these poses. We would actually 
sing all weekend, have a Saturday night gig or Sunday night gig, and we had to go to school the next day, and we'd be so tired, and we'd be so hoarse, you know, but um, we made our community very proud, and even to this day, I am 57 years old, people still want to hear the chariot gospel singers. Now, what is that going to look like now without my brother? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Listen, I woke up early this morning and I dropped down on my knees, on my knees and told the Lord, thank you, thank you for letting me see this wonderful, wonderful day. And I will tell everybody, 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 everybody Think about how good he's been to us. That's why I want to tell you in the short words down through the years. The Lord's been good to us. Oh, 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 down, 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 down. Late Mountain Road used to say that the pastor job really is to work himself out of a job. In other words, is to prepare others to carry on, you know. And, you know, sometimes we call ourselves a small church, but we are not really what you call a, a small church, but we have a, a big heart, you know. My daddy always took me to church, so I say, Paul Church. And I was small. I was uh, going to the church, I was trained up in church. I taught Sunday school almost um, 25 years, and uh, I've been an uh, officer uh, for our missionary circle, over 30, and I've worked with the finance committee. And uh, in our church, I have uh, incorporated uh, black history, uh, uh, senior citizens day, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, vacation Bible school. Granddaddy came home one day and we said, Granddaddy, he was a deacon. He said, you got happy in the church today. I said, we, we, we. He said, spirit hit you? He said, ain't no devil's spirit hit me. That once got under my hat. <laughs> we would go to the church and um, they would dress me for church. <laughs> all my clothes were always casual when I went to church. They were like, no, you no, you can't go to church. So somehow they would dress me. They have somebody's clothes that I'm, I'll be wearing somebody's clothes. I don't know who was, and it was okay. And I would be in church. And um, my favorite part was if they let me sit in the choir with them. But yeah, there were hints that I should not sing, but I got to sit in the choir. So, um, and I was supposed to just, you know, mouth the words, but sometimes I'd be overcome with, you know, the feeling and forget and start singing and I would get a look. <laughs> we knew that on Sunday mornings, we needed to be up, we needed to be moving around, you know, and our aunt, our aunt Anne and our grandmother would play, I think it's like the light radio station or something is like the radio station that's down there. So I remember like gospel music playing in the mornings as we got ready, I remember them saying like, okay, this is what you need to wear. You need to make sure you have your, your stockings on. You, you, know, you want to make sure you look nice. All the while we're thinking it's about to be 85 degrees in there. I got on all these clothes. <laughs> I also remember um, uh, being, uh, I'll call it voluntold to do a lot of different things in Second St. Paul. So it's like you get there and you're like, oh, well, you're actually going to be singing in the choir this morning. So here's the lyrics, get ready. Right? Um, or actually, we need another usher, so we're gonna need you to stand at the door and hand out the programs. I'm a deacon, I'm a trustee, I'm a Sunday school superintendent, I'm the vice president of the choir, and to sum it all up, I'm a spare time. I'm a spare time. 
Church services at Second St. Paul look very different these days. Members gather over a phone conference line to pray and worship together. In a time like this, it would seem that the physical presence of church members is needed more than ever. Because truly the Lord has been good to me. And we've experienced a lot of hardship in our family, sicknesses, but for whatever reason, the Lord has permitted us another day. And we give him the praise because he's been good. He's been good. He's been good. He's been real good. He's been good every day. He's been good every hour. He's been good every minute of the day. He's been good to me. The pandemic has shown how powerful and how needful the church is. Um, because what we found were, going back home, were elderly people that just seemed to be uh, really struggling because they could not come into the church and experience that release that we often experience in the African American church, the singing and the clapping and the crying and all the things that we go through to be able to release some of the tension. We are missing that fellowship with our sisters and brothers. We're missing that laying on hands. Pastors can't lay on hands like they used to. First thing we got to look, we got to remember what Jesus said. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Number one and then number two, what we got to understand is that uh, the church is not this physical structure. The church is in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the head and we are the body. All right. So uh, what, what we got to look at is that uh, even, even, even in the book of Acts, let me say this, even the book of Acts, now, they, they hung around Jerusalem until Stephen were killed, and then they spread it out. You see, something had to happen because Jesus told them to go therefore in all the world mm -hmm. to teach your nation, baptizing them the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what they done was they, they hung around Jerusalem. And so what this COVID has done, it has caused us to reach out even more, especially now with the uh, electronic age that we are living in. See, telephone, uh, you got duo. I mean, you have Zoom, you got Snap, you got Facebook, so you have all of those venues now. And actually, when it comes to uh, a Bible study and worship service, we have more persons now. A church should have outreach in and, uh, and the, and the neighborhood and even beyond the neighborhood. Charlie Cherry Sr.'s youngest descendants helped to make Cherrytown and Second St. Paul's transition into an electronic world possible. From teleconferences with local government officials to Zoom celebrations, members of Cherrytown were able to bridge the gap between a past of physical unity and a present of electronic integration. With COVID-19 and in a rural area with limited resources, the church really became the foundation of information. So everyone was looking to their church for PPE. Everyone was looking to their church to kind of give, um, you know, what's the next steps that we need to take. And of course, worship was no longer the case anymore. Um, so they had to find different avenues to do that. So that that's really where the teleconference came from. That extended past just our community. Um, we were also able to join several others in the county. Um, so this became more of a countywide thing. So we would have um, small teleconferences with one member of each community kind of considered as a champion to share that information of what exactly is going on, when the vaccine was going to be available to us, how the clinical trials, asking information that was important. Um, you know, what is COVID? How can I contract COVID? Um, am I able to sit six feet um, from someone and, and be in a building? Is that, you know, is that best practice? 
And so um, I was able to do a lot with uh, Second St. Paul, and I'm very grateful for that. One thing about the church, see, it spread much further than just in Cherrytown, because you see, because wherever we go, or the morals and thing, uh, it goes along with us, and so we spread it in, in other areas. One of the purposes of Second St. Paul might be to be attuned to the shifts of society and how it uniquely affects the people who are in Cherrytown currently and who are in Columbus County currently. It's staying like one ear to the ground to the ever-changing needs of the community. And I don't think that that's new. Like I mentioned, I think that it's a returning back to um, that purpose that it served when our you know, when our aunts were integrating schools and when segregation was becoming, um, or excuse me, when integration was becoming a lot more prevalent, I think it's sort of a shift back to that. In the midst of a digital age, Cherrytown stories are held in its land, in the fertile earth that fed generations. So, despite its adaptation to the present, poverty, food insecurity, and a lack of educational opportunity persist in Cherrytown and surrounding areas. Community members have varying degrees of hope as they consider what will happen to Cherrytown in the near future. I, I really, I, 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 I see no, I don't see much future. I really don't. Um, it, uh, I'm, I am one of the oldest ladies here and we don't have that many men, um, even um, middle-aged or young people. The more that I started like listening to our elders and people who actually grew up in Cherrytown, I started to paint like a, a larger picture. Um, one that is, of course, as I mentioned, like a deeply rooted in family um, and celebration <clears throat> and um, faith. Um, but also one that had in many ways been um, neglected for a long time. Um, and whether that's through, you know, people moving up and out of Cherrytown for better opportunities, or whether that's like the lack of healthcare, the lack of, you know, nourishing food supermarkets and things like that, the lack of jobs, the lack of um, really solid schools. And just sort of painted a different picture of like, oh, you know, this place that I only come to once a year, there are people who live here all year round and they have a very different perspective of what this place is. As an African-American woman, I do see my grandmother, right? And I do see her having nine children and um, looking at Wilmington being 45 minutes to an hour away and her attending school daily, and how did she make all this work, right? How did she make all this work? And the question is, am I willing to do that? Without other family members and other folks in Cherrytown who are taking up this mantle and taking up this charge, I do believe that these histories will be lost to, to time. Fortunately, descendants are taking up the mantle to preserve these stories by researching the family to produce works of academic merit and mapping the family tree with each new census, these stories will not be lost to time. Current and future generations will not allow it. When I went to school and learned, you know, history, the history of our country and stuff like that, and I wanted to know about my great grandparents' life. Oral histories, um, people's histories, um, I think are deeply important, particularly for Black communities, because we have been told in so many ways that our histories and our cultures and our lineages are disposable, or at the very least, not as important as dominant narratives. What's going to happen to Cherrytown is, is a huge question. What's going to happen to other places similar to Cherrytown if the individuals that leave um, if the individuals that are being aggressive and competitive and intelligent, if these individuals don't come back, if they don't bridge that socioeconomic divide, if they don't try to come back and bring those resources or to at least help someone um, move a step up, we don't know what will happen in Cherrytown if that doesn't happen. 
I've actually kind of came to an agreement uh, that after retirement that we would probably move back to that county um, in that small area to keep the livelihood up, to keep um, the household median up, to keep that, that type of influential marginalized African-American perspective so that other people can see that, so that other individuals are able to have a tangible resource. James Baldwin said that history is not a procession of illustrious people. It's what happens to a people, millions of people. So every single one of us should have a stake in our histories because every single one of those histories is extraordinary. We just have to see them that way. Cherrytown resides against the backdrop of every single national event that has occurred since its founding. Its story is one of American history and of the American people, but also one of a very distinct family and their path to success. The essence of Cherrytown is this story. The Cherrytown sign, Second St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church, the houses that line Cherrytown Road may cease to exist but Cherrytown's story will outlast any physical indication of its existence. All of our stories, told and untold, ignored and acknowledged, will survive the consequences of time. Somewhere. 